Welcome to the forum, folks. So glad that you could all come. It looks like week by week we keep getting more people who are finding their way in here, finding the parking, finding their way through the maze. So we're so glad that you could all come. So the forum this morning welcomes historian, author, and retired California State University professor, Dr. Don Paulson, and his talk, 100 Years of Uray County Mining, 1875 to 1975, including an update of the Uray Silver Mines Incorporation, which is currently the only operating mine in the San Juan Mountains. Don Paulson lives in Uray and is curator of the Uray County Historical Society, as well as a board member of both the Ridgeway Railroad Museum and the Trust for Land Restoration. During the last two decades, Don has written numerous articles and given talks in southwestern Colorado history. He has authored or co-authored four southwestern Colorado books, Narrow Gauge Railroading in the San Juan Triangle, 2009, The Mines, Miners, and Much More in 2015, Peaks of the Uncompagri in 2016 with Jeff Burke, and The Images of the Mountain West in Photographs and Poetry, 2019 with Beth Paulson. And he's going to have an opening or something like that on Thursday, I believe. Is that a book signing? Is that correct? Yes. Thursday, the 14th of November. Ah, it's a minute. At um, uh, 612 Clinton in Ridgeway. Ah. I'm reading from that book. No, so that's another blurb there. So, and previously, Don was a professor of chemistry at California State University, Los Angeles, for 36 years. Don enjoys nature, photography, model railroading, hiking, and jeeping in the San Juan Triangle. And mining is just one of his many interests. If you look in the newspaper, sometimes you'll see that he's talking about perhaps clergy. And um, I don't know. I can't remember everything. But anyway, let's welcome Dr. Don Paulson. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, it's great to be here. I love to come out and uh, talk about uh, mining and railroads and some of my favorite interests in uh, southwestern Colorado. Uh, it's going to be hard in just 45 minutes to uh, give you a, a complete history of mining in Uray County. So this is just an overview, hit some of the highlights, and uh, talk to you about some of my favorite places in, uh, in Uray County. Um, so let's look at a historical timeline of mining in Uray County. Uh, prospectors entered the Uray area as early as 1861. Uh, however, they were looking for placer gold. They weren't looking for hard rock mines. They were looking for the easy to get gold in the streams. And of course, that didn't work out very well. And so for about a decade, southwestern Colorado was called the humbug of Colorado. Because people were coming in and expecting to be able to, to placer mine in the streams and make a lot of money, and they didn't. Uh, and so Colorado had a bad name for about a decade. Um, large influx in 1875. The first uh, uh, explorers came into the area hundreds of years before that, but gold was discovered right around Uray and silver in 1875, and there were four claims in what, in what is now the city limits of Uray in 1875. Uh, the city of Uray was founded in 1876. It rapidly grew in population. It uh, had a population of 400 when it was founded, 700 in three years later, and the high point of Uray's population in 1890 was 2,534. Today in Uray, we have a full-time population of about 1,000, and during the summer, that will swell to two or 3,000 as people from Texas and California and Arizona come back to the mountains when all the snow is gone. Um, the late 1870s, mining was focused up Canyon Creek. Canyon Creek is the road that goes up to the Camp Bird. It's sometimes called the Camp Bird mine, our road. Uh, it goes up to Yankee Boy Basin. So there were lots of, uh, of mines up in that, up in that area. <coughs> the Wheel of Fortune mine in 1875 was founded and it was sold for $160,000 in 1877. Now to give you an idea of what that means, you multiply that by 30 to get the value in today's dollars. So we're not talking about an insignificant amount of money here. Uh, the Yankee Boy, up in Yankee Boy Basin at over 12,000 feet, uh, in 1877, 1879, they shipped $56,000 of ore 
and that ore would have been on the back of burrows, and then transferred to mules, uh, and then uh, wagons, and eventually get to the smelters in either Pueblo or Denver. Okay, this is the mineral farm mine. Uh, uh, this, in fact, is very close to where uh, some of the scenes in True Grit, if you remember the snake pit from True Grit, the snake pit is just about 100 feet from this, uh, from this mine. The only thing that's left of this is the loading bin right here, uh, and it's an interesting site to visit. It was called the Mineral Farm Mine because the ore was in veins that were really close to the surface, and they used to joke that they could just take a plow and run it along the ground and dig up the silver that was there. So that's why it was called the Mineral Farm Mine. Between 1875 and 1930, uh, $1 million worth of silver ore was taken out of that mine. Just uh, about three miles west of Uray. Uh, the Virginius Mine, one of the most interesting mines uh, in all of the San Juans. It was founded in 1876 and sold to A.E. Reynolds for $100,000 in 1880. This is in Governor Basin. If you're going up to Yankee Boy Basin, west of Uray, you come to a junction. To the right, you go to Yankee Boy. To the left, you go to Governor. Governor Basin is around 13,000 feet in elevation. Uh, this is about 13,009 up here. And so this is a really high elevation mine. Um, and uh, A.E. Reynolds was a, quite a character. Uh, we'll have a little more to say about him in a minute. But this mine uh, was up at over 13,000 feet. He bought it for $100,000 in 1880. Everybody said he was crazy. The mine remained in his family until 2012, and today it is, in fact, Uray Silver Mines in Uray. So we'll talk more about that. So what some of the things that Reynolds did, this was the uh, first time that a tunnel was dug at a low elevation for two reasons. Up in the uh, mountains above Uray, much of the ore is in vertical tubes. And so you need a lot of shaft mining. And what happens when you dig a shaft is it fills up with water. And then you have to pump the water up. And that costs money. And the lower you go, the more it costs to pump the water up. Also, unfortunately, in the San Juans, the really high-valued ore is at the top. And as you dig deeper and deeper and deeper, the value of the ore becomes less valuable. However, since you're digging deeper, it costs more to haul it out. So you're getting less valuable ore, but it's costing you more to get it out. So Reynolds got the idea, let's go about 2,000 feet below the mine, and let's dig a mile-long tunnel that will drain our shafts, and it will also make it very much easier to get the ore out, because we can drop the ore instead of having a hoist to pull it out. So very, very innovative. The first time that was done in the United States. So the revenue tunnel mines, 1880 to 1920, when uh, Reynolds died, $28 million worth of silver ore was taken out of that mine. Uh, and so his investment of $100,000 turned out to be pretty, pretty valuable. Whoops. We can go back. There we go. Um, this is a picture of the revenue mill. Uh, this is about 2,000 feet below where the Virginius mine is, and so that's where the tunnel was. Uh, this is a 40 stamp mill, and we'll talk a little bit later about what a stamp mill is. Uh, but this is a stamp mill, they had their own sawmill, they had two big boarding houses. About 500 men lived there uh, in the 1890s. An unbelievably large operation. Okay, let's talk about Red Mountain, the Red Mountain silver mines. In Uray, between 1875 and 1900, everything was about silver. Silver was what we were developing. Uh, and so uh, there were lots of uh, silver mines on Red Mountain. The Silver Bell, there were essentially five or six big mines in Uray, up on Red Mountain. The Silver Bell operated between 1879 and 1890. About a million dollars worth of ore was taken out of that mine. The Gustin mine, 81 to 96, $6 million worth of ore. And again, multiply that by 30 to get the value of today's dollar. 
The Yankee Girl, probably the most famous mine up on Red Mountain because you can still see the, the uh, hoist house which is there today. Uh, approximately $12 million in that 16 years. And the National Bell, uh, $9 million. So an enormous amount of silver ore was taken out of those uh, mines uh, on Red Mountain. Now let's talk about what a typical mine up in your ray would have. This is the Yankee Girl Mine, and there's all kinds of buildings here. Let's talk about what those buildings are. First of all, we have the head frame, uh, which was uh, the top of the shaft, and the shaft at the Yankee Girl went down about 1,500 feet. They had all the problems that many mines had there of water filling up the, the tunnel and the ore becoming less valuable, but that's the head frame uh, where the shaft was located. We have the coal house right here. We have the blacksmith shop and machine shop right here, right next to the mine entrance. So we could bring the tools back up to the uh, uh, tools to be sharpened. Uh, the, the, all of the uh, blacksmithing shop went on there. We also have the manager's house. If you look around at the buildings here, it's probably not too difficult to pick out which place was the manager's house. And it's right there. And then we have the miners' cabins who lived uh, in not quite as uh, elegant a uh, place. And then we have uh, the compressor and powerhouse. So that was all driven by coal uh, to make steam to operate all the machinery. And then we have the sorting house where the ore was sorted and removed from the waste rock. Uh, the definition of ore is uh, anything that's solid that you can get out of the ground that you can sell for a profit. If you can't sell it for a profit, it's waste rock, and you throw it over the side. And then we have a railroad that came there. Probably most of you are not familiar with the Silverton Railroad. I'm not talking about the Durango and Silverton, but a railroad that started in Silverton, went over the top of Red Mountain Pass, essentially on Highway 550, all the way over the top of the pass to Red Mountain, to, to the mines there, and all the way down into the Ironton Valley. This is the main line of the railroad right here. Uh, this is the coal spur, where they brought the coal in to dump in the coal house. And this is the uh, ore spur. So this is the sorting house. The waste rock was dumped over the side. The ore was put in sacks, put in the railroad cars, and taken to the smelter. So that's a typical mine operation on Red Mountain uh, in the 1880s, 1890s. Now, the silver crash of 1893 uh, that previous slide where I showed you all of the big mines on Red Mountain, you will notice that all of the dates ended in the mid to late 1890s. So all of the mining up on Red Mountain crashed in the mid-1890s. And the reason for that, and it, we'll talk about that right, it's called the Silver Crash of 1893. In 1878, Congress passed the Bland-Allison Act, which required the government, which was on the silver standard, to purchase Two, two to four million ounces of silver per month. Lots and lots of silver. Then, in 1890, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was passed, which required the government to buy four and a half million ounces of silver per month. Now, fortuitously, that was just about the total output of all of the Western silver mines. So they had a guaranteed buyer, they had strong prices, and they were making oodles of money in the late 1880s and the early 1890s. However, uh, so silver dollars could be turned in for gold. In August 1893, the Sherman Act was repealed. Earlier that summer, India, meaning Great Britain, had gone off the silver standard to the gold standard. And in August of 1893, the Sherman Act was repealed, and the U.S. went on to the gold standard instead of the silver standard. So the government was no longer buying all of this silver, and uh, almost overnight, silver dropped from $1.50 an ounce to 50 cents an ounce. And within the next three or four years, all of the big silver mines on Red Mountain um, went out of business. So thousands of mines in southwestern Colorado closed over the next five years. Um, if you uh, Go to Aspen today, which was another big silver mining area. If you go to Aspen and you look for mining, you can't find anything. 
Uh, there's no indication as you wander around the streets of Aspen and look up in the mountains that any mining ever went on there. And that's because Aspen never had any gold. And when the silver crashed, and there was no gold, mining completely stopped. But fortunately for us in southwestern Colorado, gold was discovered and uh, rescued all of the cities. There we go. So gold mines saved your ray. If you stand in downtown your ray and look to the north, you will see a gold-colored hill on the east side of the Interpondre Canyon, and uh, that's called Gold Hill. And it's not called Gold Hill because the uh, color is gold, which it is. It's called Gold Hill because of the gold mines that were discovered up there in the late 1890s. So we have the Jonathan, the Bright Diamond, the American Eddie. Uh, one of the things that you'll also notice uh, about mine names is a lot of times there's two names. There's the American Dash Netty. Uh, there is the Bright and Diamond. And these are mines that consolidated from two separate mines. The uh, mining laws in the U.S. are really very interesting. Uh, if you find a, an outcropping, uh, a, a uh, uh, silver or some uh, ore, so you'll find this outcropping, and then you make a claim, which is usually 300 feet by 1,500 feet, uh, and then you start digging in that outcropping, um, and uh, you have a vein. And you can follow that vein wherever it goes. It doesn't matter if it crosses somebody else's property. As long as that vein is consistent, you can follow it and follow it and follow it. If, however, the vein stops and then starts up again a foot later, you can't go across that foot because now you're on somebody else's property. So what this amounted to was a class of citizen that made a lot of money out of mining. Can anybody figure out what that might be? And the word begins with an L. Lawyers. And so, for example, the American and the Netty fought with each other for years about whether they were violating each other's uh, space, and finally they said, oh well, we'll join together. So lots of the mines up in uh, above your ray. Uh, we have the Genesee Vanderbilt, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, they lost a lot of money fighting each other, and then finally they decided to join forces. So gold really saved your ray. Okay, this is the American Netty mine. Uh, this is the outhouse right on the corner here, straight down. Uh, this is the bunkhouse. Uh, the mine entrance is over here. One of the big, big mines up there. This is a picture from uh, probably about 1898. Uh, and if you stand on Highway 550 about a mile north of Uray and look up, you can see this mine. The building's on there, but you can see the waste rock that was uh, thrown over the edge. Okay, probably the most famous mine around here is the Camp Bird. I'm sure all of you have heard of the Camp Bird mine. Uh, Tom Walsh uh, was prospecting up in Imogene Basin, uh, about 12,000 feet above Uray, and he found all of this uh, material that had been taken out of uh, prospect holes and just thrown over the edge. And he very quietly assayed this waste rock and found out that, gee, it didn't have any silver value, but it had an incredible amount of gold value. And so Tom very quietly bought up all of the claims in Imogene Basin and founded the Camp Bird Mine. It's called the Camp Bird Mine because uh, the camp robber bird, every time uh, Walsh tried to sit down and have lunch, the camp robber birds wouldn't let him alone and tried to take his lunch away from him. So he named the mine the Camp Bird. Uh, between 1896 and 1902, Walsh made $4 million in profit. Not $4 million in ore, but $4 million in profit. He sold the Camp Bird in 1902 for $6 million. Between 1902 and 1916, the Camp Bird Limited, which was an English uh, company, uh, made $15 million in profit. And the total output from that mine in the 74 years that it existed, wow. exceeded $50 million. That's the profit, that's not the total ore that was taken out. So quite, quite a, and almost all of that value is in gold. Well, maybe. There we go. 
This is the Camp Bird Mill area in about 1900. Uh, the original Camp Bird mine is up here. Uh, this is level 14, and that means that it is 1400 feet lower than the original mine. Uh, what they did when they dug a shaft, every 100 feet, they, they would dig a tunnel out from that shaft. And so 100 feet a tunnel, 100 feet a tunnel. And then from those tunnels, they would dig up and dig down and get to all of the ore. Uh, there was a very long tunnel here that went back in, and then the shaft came out. And it, again, it did the same thing that the revenue did. It drained the water out of the mine, and it also allowed to drop the ore instead of having to raise it to the surface. So this is a, we'll talk in a minute about what a stamp mill is, but this is a stamp mill, and there are 80 stamps in that particular mill. This is the cyanide mill. We'll talk about that in a little bit later, but cyanide is the current uh, favorite process for, for recovering ore, and in the 1890s, uh, Tom Walsh was recovering about 85%, 85 to 90 percent of the gold value when a typical mine usually got less than 50 percent. So Walsh used the very latest techniques. Um, we could spend a whole hour talking about Tom Walsh. Really interesting character. Uh, he hated unions. He was a staunch Republican. But he treated his men well. There's a memorable speech that he gave in 1910 to the graduating class of the Colorado School of Mines where he said, that any employer's most valuable asset is not the property, but it's the people who work for him. So he was an unusually enlightened person for the Victorian period. Okay, let's talk about a stamp mill. Uh, how do we get the gold, or whatever more we're after? How do we get that out of the mine? Well, let's say that the, uh, the mine entrance is over here. We have an ore cart. So we bring out the stuff that we think is gonna be valuable. The other stuff we've just thrown over the side of the cliff. So we take this ore that comes out of the mine, we dump it here, and it goes through a grizzly. And the grizzly is iron bars that are about that far apart, and anything that will fall through those iron bars, anything smaller than about that size, will fall into an ore bin. If you cannot go through the ore bin, you're too big. And so if you're poor, uh, you use a sledgehammer to break up that rock so that it would go into the bin. You got a little more money, you buy a Blake jaw crusher, and that crusher works like this. Uh, it crushes and then opens and crushes and opens, and it's a, it's a rotary type thing, so these jaws clamp together every time that wheel goes around, crushing the ore and making it uh, smaller than the grizzly bars, and now we have a whole bin that's full of ore. Now, how do we get the good stuff out of that? Well, we go to the stamps. Um, this is a stamp, and there are five stamps here and five stamps there. The stamps are about this big around and about that tall. They weigh seven to 800 pounds. Now, a cam picks them up and then drops them. We have a metal plate on the bottom, steel plate on the bottom, iron plate. So the, this uh, stamp is raised and then dropped, and raised and then dropped. Now, the Camp Bird Mill had 80 of those. No ear protection. The mill workers usually went deaf. So this banging was going on 24 hours a day, and you can imagine the sound from five to 600 pound things, 80 of them being picked up and dropped, and picked up and dropped. Now, so inside, this is where the, the uh, stamps are dropping. Inside there, you put a little bit of water in there. So. Every time that stamp drops, you get stuff that's sprayed all over the inside of that cavity, and there's a screen wire on the front. So this ore is crushed and crushed and crushed, and it can't get out of there until it's small enough to go through the screen. So we get a fine sand of crushed ore that comes through that screen. And then it goes on to what are called amalgamating tables. It's a copper table, about six feet wide, 10 to 12 feet long with a slight angle, uh, pitch, covered with copper, and then the copper is covered with mercury. And so we have a, a water-sand mixture flowing across this mercury. And if you're as old as I am, you've probably got some uh, a mercury amalgam fillings in your, in, in your mouth. Um, and so mercury will make an amalgam with the pure gold and silver. 
So <laughs> once every week or so, they scrape off the mercury, they distill it, they reuse the mercury, and the, what's left when the mercury is distilled is a mixture of pure gold and silver. That's put in a bag, an armed guard, and sent to the smelter where, where they will separate the silver and the gold. Okay, now we're left with not pure gold and silver, but oxidized gold and silver. And so, how do we separate that from the unimportant, not valuable material? And we do that by gravity. Um, this is called a uh, Wilfrey uh, concentration table. Mr. Wilfrey became a millionaire by inventing this. By 1900, there were 15,000 Wilfrey uh, separating tables in Uray County alone. So it's very, very uh, lucrative business. So what's a Wilfrey, Wilfrey separating table? About six feet wide, about 15 feet long, covered with linoleum, and then redwood riffles about that tall. So what we do is we let the ore in here, and again, it's a fine sand. Uh, it's not been, uh, it's been across the mercury. Uh, and the gold and, pure gold and silver has been removed. So the gold and silver uh, that's oxidized, it's very heavy. It's very dense. But the worthless material, the silica, etc., is very light, not very dense. So this table does this. And the material here tries to make it over those wet redwood ripples. If you're a very light material, you can go over the redwood ripples very easily. But if you're a very heavy material, you just can't get over those riffles. And so you will go down and come off the end of the table called the ore end. So anything that comes off there has been concentrated. And of course, that's the whole purpose of this mill, to take gold and silver ore that might be 2 or 3% gold and silver and turn it into something that may be 60, 70% gold and silver. Um, now, this side of the table, this is where all the useless material comes off, works its way along the ripples and falls off, and that's called the tail of the table. And so the tailings are the waste material from uh, the milling process. If you drive the million dollar highway south out of your rig, you see these beautiful meadows. As you go up, uh, up to the top of Red Mountain Pass, there's these beautiful green meadows that are all over the place. Well, those are actually tailing piles. They're actually 50, 60 feet tall, have thousands and thousands of tons of the tailings material, the fine sand that's come off of here. Big environmental problem. It rains. The water drains. It go through, goes through these tailings, leaches out all the bad stuff. There are no fish in the Uncompahgre River until you get to the Ridgeway Reservoir because of all of the material that's been uh, taken out of those tailings piles. So, the state of Colorado sued the Idorado Mining Company, and they came to a consent agreement in the late, 18, uh, excuse me, late 1990s, and what they did was they ran concrete channels around those tailings piles, so instead of the rainwater going through the pile and extracting all of the bad stuff, it goes in the concrete channels. Then they put manure and straw and grass on top of that, and so now we have these beautiful meadows. Uh, but in fact, they are still enormous piles of very toxic material. Okay, so what comes off the ore end of the table uh, is put in sacks and shipped to, the, to the, the smelter where it is reduced from the oxidized gold and silver to the pure gold and silver. Okay, so that's a, oh, this is a Blake Crusher, by the way. I showed you the diagram. This is a picture of an actual uh, Blake Crusher at the Lewis Mill above the uh, about uh, Telluride. Okay, so that's a real quick and dirty look at how uh, the mill operates. Uh, there's also something called the middlings, which are not quite as good as the ore, but they're not as bad as the tailings. So the middlings go to other processes. So there's lots of other stuff that goes on in the mill, but that gives you a quick, uh, dirty look at how the mill concentrates the ore uh, that we get out of the money. Okay. Uh, these are the stamps at the Camp Bird Mine, and 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, there's 80 of them. And they go 24 hours a day, and they make it enormous. Here's the amalgamation tables. Uh, here is a diagram of a uh, Wilfley table. Uh, this is the uh, 
the bad stuff that's coming off here. This is the middlings. This is the real good stuff over here. So again, it's separating by gravity. The lighter stuff we throw away, that becomes the tailings piles. And this is at the uh, uh, Sound Democrat mill up above Silverton, and these are two actually uh, Wilfley separation tables that are still in pretty good shape. You can see the, the redwood ripples there on top of the linoleum. Okay, early 20th century. Now we're, now we're into gold. Silver, um, not as valuable, so now we're looking for gold. So we have the Treasury Tunnel on Red Mountain, 1898 to 1910. Uh, this is one of my favorite photographs ever. Uh, this is well before there was a Highway 550, but Highway 550 is right here. The Idorado Mine is right there. But this is uh, 100 years earlier. This is the Treasury Tunnel Mine. This is their mill. Uh, there's two boxcars down there. Uh, absolutely amazing photograph. The railroad started out in Silverton, Otto Mears Silverton Railroad, over the top of Red Mountain Pass. The Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad had uh, uh, run a survey from Silverton over the top of Red Mountain Pass. They said, no, you never can build a railroad there. So what did Otto Mears do? He took the DNRG survey and built the railroad. <laughs> and here we are on the north side of Red Mountain Pass with two boxcars at the bottom of the mill. You might ask, well, why are there boxcars? Why aren't there ore cars? Well, the trains that took this ore out, they're going five to 10 miles an hour. So if they had a whole bunch of open cars, some guy with a shovel and a gunny sack could get on the car, <laughs> shovel the ore in it, jump off and make $1,000. And so the ore from these mines was never shipped in ore cars. That was for, uh, for copper ore or, or iron ore in the Midwest. That was shipped in locked boxcars because a boxcar of ore could be worth ten, twenty thousand dollars in the 1890s. And so you don't want that sitting around uh, for people to get into. I have a picture of them loading ore in the 1940s from a, from a truck backed up to a boxcar and they're shoveling the ore out of the truck into sacks and they have a, a, a rug between the truck and the car so that any of the stuff that fell on the ground could be recovered. That's how valuable the, the ore was. All right. The Atlas Mine. This is one of my favorite mines. It's really easy to get to. Uh, it's up, you have to know where it is, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, because a lot of people don't go there. Uh, but it, it is an absolutely unbelievable uh, There we go. This is the Atlas Mill. Uh, if you've been up to Yankee Boy Basin, you've seen this ruin uh, up on your left just before you start up into Yankee Boy Basin. That's their boarding house. Boarding house was torn down in the 50s and used to build a motel in your ray. Uh, this was a 20 stamp mill, a little bit smaller than the Camp Bird Mill, but still making a lot of noise up in the canyon. Okay, the mountaintop mine, uh, great mine, uh, 1911 to 1924. In 1922, it hired 50 men. It's up in Governor Basin at 13,000 feet, uh, and it was the largest employer in Uray County in 1922. And it did something very remarkable. It built a mill underground. Now up at 13,000 feet, uh, you can probably get up there four months of the year if you're lucky because of the snow. So what do you do the other eight months? You can't do anything, everything's covered with snow. You couldn't operate the mill, it's buried in snow. So they build a mill underground. The first time in the United States that a mill was built underground. And uh, the uh, uh, Scientific American in, uh, I think it was 1916, 1917, they did a big spread in one issue about the importance of this underground mill. We talked about the Blake Crusher a little while ago. There's a Blake Crusher right there. This is underground. This is the uh, skip uh, that delivered the ore to the, to the underground mill. Uh, it had a couple of Wilfley shaker tables here. Uh, so we know what it looked like in uh, around 1916, 1917. 
Now, all this stuff is still there. This is the Wilfley Shaker table. This picture was taken in last summer, or two summers ago, uh, 2018. There's the Blake Crusher, and there's the Wilfley Shaker table. You can see the redwood riffles right here. Uh, I have a young friend who's a sophomore at a mining college in Montana, uh, and he goes into these mines. He's absolutely insane. Uh, I took him up to the camp, to, up to the uh, mountaintop, and uh, we had an agreement that he would come out and, and, and acknowledge that he was still alive every five minutes. And if he didn't come back in five minutes, I was calling Mountain Rescue. So, uh, an interesting kid. But anyway, he went in there and took these pictures uh, about a thousand feet into that mine where the mill was. Uh, okay, the Depression, 1929 to 1940. Uh, big problem all over the country. There were a couple things that happened in Uray that stopped Uray from becoming a ghost town. There are two people that I just want to mention. One is Gustav Franz. Um, he came to uh, the, the uh, southwestern Colorado in the mid-1920s, and uh, he built this mill uh, in 1929. And if you know your history about the Depression, that was not the, the greatest time to start uh, doing a new business. Uh, this mill is located at what is now called Panoramic Heights. There are some houses here. Um, when I first uh, was looking for property in Uray in the early uh, 1990s, uh, a realtor took me up here and he said, boy, this is the best view there is in Uray. Look at what you get. And I said, yes, but that whole subdivision is built on a tailings pile. And he said, oh, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, people jokingly called it acid flats because you couldn't grow any grass. Now, it became a super fun site. Uh, well, just, just back to Franz, he worked the dumps of other mines. Remember I said that the stuff that you can't sell for a profit is called waste rock. What you can sell for a profit is called ore. Now, as the mining recovery process becomes better and better, the waste rock of the 1890s becomes ore of the 1940s. And so he worked the mine dumps at the Bachelor, the Mickey Breen, the Dunmore, etc., and took it, took them to his mill, now using more modern techniques, so that he was able to recover the gold and silver from that. And this site was also a super fund. Well, he employed over 50 miners. So that's probably 40 or so families in Uray that had a job. If it hadn't been for Gustav Franz, would not have had a job. And uh, it was a, okay, he's credited with saving your rent. Anyway, it became a Superfund site, and five years ago, they dug two feet of, of uh, soil out of panoramic heights and replaced all of the dirt. Okay. This is another character, William McCullough. Uh, he was a Uray County Commissioner for 25 years. He was called Chief Uray. Uh, really, really, uh, his family is incredibly uh, famous. His great-grandson, Brian Briggs, is now the CEO of Uray Silver Mines. Uh, his uh, wife was the postmaster in Uray for 20 years. His daughter, Barbara, was the next postmaster in Uray for 20 years. And when Barbara was a young woman, she was the school teacher at the Camp Bird Mine. So this McCullough family is a very, very historic family. Uh, so what did he do? Well, he operated the American Netty on Gold Hill, the Guadalupe in Ironton Park, the Mountain King on the east slope of Mount Hayden, uh, the Yankee Girl. He actually took the dump from the Yankee Girl and built an aerial tram to take the ore up to the old uh, Treasury Tunnel Mill. Probably the only time an aerial tram was ever used to take ore up instead of taking ore down. Uh, so uh, this picture just epitomizes the, the character that, uh, that he was. And again, he and Franz are credited with having saved your ray from becoming a ghost town uh, in the, during the Depression. Okay, okay now, large-scale mining. Um, during World War I and World War II, uh, particularly during World War II, it was illegal 
to mine gold. Uh, they didn't want to have miners being used to uh, mine gold. They needed miners to mine for copper, lead, and zinc, the so-called base metals. There is lots of copper, lead, and zinc up in Red Mountain, up in, south, in, in the mines of southwestern Colorado. So instead of mining for gold and silver, they were mining for lead and zinc, particularly lead and zinc. Now, they didn't throw the gold away, uh, but uh, their, their goal was uh, the base metals and not gold and silver. So the Idorado mine, uh, uh, contraction of Idaho and Colorado, owned by the Newmont Mining Company, which today is the biggest gold mining company in the world, and Newmont owns the, the Idorado mine. Uh, it operated on Red Mountain between 1938 and 1979. Uh, they took out $30 million worth of ore during that time period. Uh, they built a big mill on Red Mountain Pass. Uh, and in 1956, they closed the mill on Red Mountain Pass and opened another mill, which is still there, the Gray Mill in Pandora, east of uh, Telluride. Uh, if you've been up to look at Bridal Vale Falls, you've seen the big mill, and it's called the Gray Mill. Under Red Mountain, there are 80 miles of tunnels. It's just absolutely unbelievable, the, the amount of mining uh, that went on there. Um, the Camp Bird, 1896 to 1978. Again, uh, after World War One, the focus was on copper, lead, and zinc. The Genesee Vanderbilt, another big mine on the Revenue Tunnel, which we talked about before. And you notice that by the early 1980s, all of these mines had closed. Now they closed uh, not necessarily because they ran out of ore. Uh, they closed because the environmental disaster that they had created up there uh, was finally recognized as something that we needed to do something about. And so the cost of mining because of the environmental protection that I think most of us think are a good idea. Uh, that costs so much money that you can't mine the ore at a profit. So that's why all of the mining really ceased uh, in, uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, when I first came to Uray and started jeeping around looking at all the mines, I couldn't find any tailings piles. I could find tailings piles from the modern mills but the Yankee Girl, I couldn't find, uh, you know, any of these mines that I knew had mills, couldn't find their tailings piles. And the reason I couldn't find them is there weren't any. They dumped the tailings in the creek. And in the early years of the 20th century, the ranchers in the Uncompahgre Valley were complaining bitterly about their cattle, dying from arsenic poisoning, mercury poisoning, drinking the water in the Red Mountain Creek. Uh, and so Colorado was essentially the first state to pass laws that said, hey, you can't take those tailings and dump them in the creek. You have to impound them. And so they created these big lakes, and the, the tailings was uh, in a slurry pumped into a lake. Uh, and then the lake, uh, uh, the water would evaporate, and they'd bring in more slurry. And so these tailings piles went from a foot deep to 60 feet deep. And tons and tons, thousands of tons of of waste material. Okay. Now, in uh, the 20th century, that uh, stamp mill, those went out, probably the last real stamp mills were in the 1920s. So there was some big uh, change in what happened in mill processing. And so we went to ball mills instead of stamp mills. A ball mill is essentially a big wash machine, a uh, very, very big wash machine filled with iron balls about that big around, and the, the, the tub turns, and the iron balls crush the ore into a fine sand. They do the same thing that the stamps did, but much more efficiently. Now, instead of you separating the ores by uh, gravity, what they did is the process of flotation was invented around 1910, and by 1920, most of the uh, mills had switched to flotation, this is a very mysterious process. And what you do is you take some kind of oil, mix it with water, and, and put the ore in here, and run um, uh, air through this, and so you get a foam on top of that. And depending on the ore that you use, copper ore will stick to the foam, but not zinc, 
not lead, not gold. Now, then you change the, 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 the composition of that oil a little bit, and now copper won't stick to it anymore, but zinc will stick to it. So you have these flotation cells. You have a cell that takes the copper out, a cell that takes the silver out, a cell that takes the lead out. Uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting. So they, they use a spiral classifier to, to separate the various sizes of the rock, then they use a ball mill and you crushed it in a ball mill. A rod mill is just a long washing machine. Instead of having balls in it, it has long rods in it. And the rods turn like this as the machine is turned. And again, crush the ore. Uh, <clears throat> so I just talked to you about the flotation process. Uh, the Atlas Mill in Murray County was the first one to use that in 1914. Okay, the cyanide process, um, it's a little complicated, but you can uh, take the gold and oxidize it, and uh, it makes a compound called uh, gold cyanide. Uh, then you take that material, which is water soluble, you take that material and then you reduce it, and they use zinc to reduce it, you can also use electrochemical reduction, and this is the way today that we uh, separate gold. Uh, you might have remembered in the 1980s or 90s, there was a spill of a cyanide process in Summit County. It killed all the fish for 100 miles, did all kinds of damage. So there are problems uh, with, with uh, the modern methods as well as the old methods. And again, the waste material we still have to deal with and it goes to settling ponds and of course now it has cyanide in it instead of uh, just mercury and other things. Okay. I think I may need a thermometer. Here we go. Okay, I just got some pictures to show you here, some stamp mills. Uh, this is the Atlas <coughs> Mill. You can see that on the way to the Yankee Boy. This is the tor uh, torpedo eclipse mill. You can see the big wheel here that turned the cams. Uh, and those wheels are actually made out of wood. And the reason they're made out of wood is the, the tremendous vibration in the stamp mill. If that wheel was made out of iron, it would crack in a short period of time. So all the wheels that lift and drop those cams are made out of wood. Uh, this is the San Juan Sheaf Mill, which just went by there for a second. Uh, <clears throat> this is a mill that's still there. It's north of Uray, just on the outskirts of Uray. It was built by the American Netty in 1890. Here's the tram house that went up to the, to the mill on the other side of the canyon. Uh, and then in 1910, it was turned into a smelter. So now it's called the Wanaka Smelter. You can see it's the same building, but it's been remodeled now into a smelter instead of a mill. And then in 1956, it was remodeled back into a, uh, a mill. Uh, this is a flotation mill. It has all of the original equipment in it. So it's a marvelous structure that's on the north edge of your uh, Okay, We talked about the ball mills. This is the ball mill and the silver shield. Uh, you can see it's just a big uh, tub that rotates and rotates and it's got balls inside of it and crushes the ore. Uh, this is the flotation process at that same mill. Uh, so the, there's a water trough in here and uh, we have that uh, foam scum on top of the water and uh, this wheel picks up that foam, scrapes it off and send, sends it. So we're, if we've got the right uh, chemicals in here, only a particular element will be attached to that foam. Very, very ingenious process. This is another process, a um, little bit more complicated, but this wheel goes around and these paddles, again, scrape off that foam. Now, some boarding houses. Uh, there's some beautiful boarding houses up around your Uh The mountaintop mine, 13,100 feet. The bimetallist mine up on the, above the Camp Bird Road. Uh, the yellow jacket, a little bit worse for wear than the boarding house. Uh, the Wanaka, if you drive north out of Uray and look up on the hillside, you can see this building. This is the tram tower, this is the boarding house. Uh, this is the Neosha uh, mine. If you drive south out of Uray, you've probably seen the sign that says antiques and the laundry line. That's the Neosha. There's a, a a great story about that, which I don't have time to go into, but it's an interesting place. Uh, the Joker Tunnel, one of my favorite names for a mine, the Joker Mine. 
Uh, the Joker Tunnel was dug at a low level on Red Mountain to drain the water out of all those mines that we mentioned, and it was very, very successful. Uh, for many, many years, it was a profitable venture. Uh, head frames. If you've got a shaft, you have to have a head frame to bring that rope up over the top and, and into a coil. These are dotted all over the mountains around Uray. Uh, this is the American Girl. This is the Colorado Boy. Both of these are visible from Highway 550. Uh, what you notice about these two is that they were built by the same person. They have exactly the same design. Uh, they've been restored by grants to the Uray County Historical Society. Great sites to visit. During the summer, I lead hikes up there, so if you're interested in that, go to EuraCountyHistoricalSociety.org, our website. You can find out when those hikes are. This is the Kohler Longfellow head frame. Again, all these buildings look just like that today. Uh, here's the Memphis mine. This is the funkiest thing I've ever seen. It's still there. You can see it from Highway 550. The mine is right here. This is the sorting house. The waste rock falls down here over the edge, and it just falls down. And uh, It hasn't been used, of course, for many years, but it fell down, and it covered the road out of your ray, and they had to, to move the, the waste rock aside. This is the ore which goes into this bin and which was loaded onto trucks. Great site, it's still there, you can hike to it. Uh, this is the boarding house before I got a grant to restore it. And here we have the restored boarding house. Um, just a few more things here. This is the Chief Uray mine. Uh, there's a wonderful trail called the Chief Uray Trail above Uray, which goes to a beautiful waterfall. A boarding house, you have to actually walk through the boarding house as part of the trail. Um, here's the blacksmith shop for that mine, and there's the city of Uray down below. All kinds of great places you can hike to. Uh, the Atlas Mine, uh, just look at these photos. Uh, what an unbelievable place. Uh, sometime during the Korean War, in a scrap drive, they hauled all of the stuff out of the mine. They were going to scrap it. The road got washed out, and it's all still there. <laughs> just a, one of the most fascinating sites I've ever been to. Uh, just all kinds of stuff laying on this little plateau. Uh, and it's not too hard to get to. Okay. Okay, mining today. Uh, there were several small mines that had been operating uh, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, the Gustin Mine Dump was uh, redone. The Mountaintop Mine. Um, probably the most successful was the Ruby Trust. They got into a fight with the contractor, said he was high grading, meaning he was stealing the gold and not sharing it with the owner. Uh, those have all folded. Um, the really only mine that's still operating in Uray County is the old Revenue. Uh, uh, A.E. Reynolds founded that in the 1880s. In, uh, in 2012, the descendants of Reynolds sold the mine uh, and the old, new owner built an underground mill, a very new state-of-the-art underground mill. However, they skipped, skimmed on safety. Uh, in 2013, there was an accident. Two people died, 20 were injured. They, of course, lost the mine. It was taken over by a Canadian company. They defaulted on their loan and it was sold to a local group. Whoops. Uh, headed by Brian Briggs, the great-grandson of uh, William McCullough, who we talked about. And it's now called the Uray Silver Mines. They are seeking investors. They have shipped some ore. I keep hearing reports that they're going to go full-time with 150 employees. They have 20 employees, and we're hoping that, uh, that it will work out. Uh, and, of course, they have this uh, new underground mill. Uh, and the waste rock will be put back into the mine, into the mined out areas, instead of the waste rock being taken outside and dumped over the side. So this is a, a, a environmentally sound and, and really exciting thing. And I think finally I got some pictures of that. Okay, this is the ball mill. This is underground. Uh, it's actually quite close to the surface, uh, but it is totally underground. Uh, and it's in this long, long, very, very large tunnel. So that's the ball mill where the initial crushing of the ore takes place. And then these are the flotation tanks. 
So each one of these flotation tanks is specific, one for lead, one for zinc, one for silver. Uh, not any gold in this mine, uh, but it, it's, they're producing a lot of silver uh, from, their, from their ore. A couple years ago, they, they had a, uh, an opportunity to go into the mine, uh, and that was before Uray Silver Mines owned it, and uh, I can't believe that they did it. We were able to climb up ladders, go into uh, ore areas, uh, look at the vein in the ceiling. Uh, apparently the lawyers never found out what they were doing because they never would have allowed people in there if they had. But it was just a phenomenal to go, you know, to start at the mill, uh, to take the tram and go back in 2,000 feet, climb these ladders and go into the, uh, the attics that were there. It was uh, uh, absolutely fascinating. Okay, a couple of final comments. Um, Uray exists principally because of one thing. And that's tourism. Now, a new type of tourism is coming to southwestern Colorado, and that is maybe uh, heritage tourism. There are a lot of people coming because they're interested in the mining history, and they want to to go and look at the mines and and, and see the history that's there. And that's why it's so important for us to maintain and prevent from being destroyed, the mining structures are there. I mean, a, a mine with some waste rock and nothing next to it, well, that's kind of interesting. But how interesting is that if there's a boarding house there, if there's some kind of building there? Um, of course, we have environmental problems that are being worked on. So one of the things we need to do is protect and preserve our mining heritage. Um, I would like all of you to visit the Uray County Museum. It's a fun place to, uh, uh, to work. Uh, I give guided hikes in the summer on Red Mountain Pass, so if you're interested in that, go to our website, urayconyhistoricalsociety.org. And uh, you don't know who these people are, but uh, without these people, I could not have uh, done this talk or all this stuff. And uh, of course, the most important person, whoops, Back here is my wife, who uh, puts up with all the stuff that I do. <laughs> and just to let you know, I have published a book on mining. Uh, it's called Mines, Miners, and Much More. You can buy it at Maggie's Bookstore in, in Montrose or at your local visitor center. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr.